Thanks, Steve, for the introduction. Um, I was actually going to give some overview uh, of the fake news. If anyone has uh, interest in that, I'm delighted to go into more detail because I actually think that uh, that is one of the problems of our time. Uh, but Regina had asked me to give kind of an overview of kind of the major issues in platforms and their structure, as well as some of the research going forward. So I was going to cover four major problems, the free pricing, the firm structure, antitrust, and misinformation. Um, over the course of, in effect, 20 years, pointing out that all of them, every single one of them is in effect driven by the same underlying phenomena, which is why I think this is so interesting. Um, since I'm presenting, uh, I can't see if anyone's raising their hand or putting something in the chat, so feel free to interrupt if you wanna ask questions along the way. I'm, I'm very happy to take questions en route. Uh, but as Steve mentioned, uh, understanding the platform economy seems central to policy debates on pricing, net neutrality, financial market reform, antitrust, privacy, consumer protection, and media diversity. There's a huge number of different issues uh, related to this. And I think the research is both telling and uh, interesting going forward. If we look at the problem that we started with perhaps 20 years ago uh, and the two-sided network problem, how can free possibly make sense? You know, in the original models, it's not tying. It's not razors and blades or papers and printer because you don't have to buy one item with the other. It's also not penetration pricing. Free good is free into perpetuity. You never have to pay for the upgrade or any uh, of the other features. So what was happening? Um, to give you a kind of fun slide from 20 years ago, this is work with Jeffrey Parker. This is literally a 20 year old slide. Uh, we look at the, the different content. There's the PDF distiller and the PDF reader or the game engine and the game level editor or the uh, audio uh, recording and audio playing or Wolfram Mathematic or Mathematica Reader. Uh, in fairness to our also audience, um, Jean Charles uh, Rocher also had a wonderful chart in their paper on something quite similar. It also included credit cards and shopping malls and real estate as other examples of these two-sided markets. To illustrate them kind of graphically, what we'd shown uh, as a motivating example, here are some of the level editors that are given away for free for mythical games and then developers in the user community completely adapted them to do such things as creating civil war games. Of course, adding immense value to the product simply by having giving away the tools to create new product, if you will. Like creation of new product is something I'll come back to in a moment. How does this work? If you've got markets for production and consumption, or rather markets for the developers and the users, you might model them in the following way. And the blue box, of course, would represent the profits. Uh, on a zero marginal cost good. But if there's an externality that crosses those markets, um, so in our original paper, we modeled it as linear demand. Um, Jean Charles and um, Jean Tirole modeled it with a somewhat more elegant, uh, it certainly had a nicer, uh, on the right-hand side, a nicer elasticity properties. But the models are very similar in that if you discount to one side, the quantity consumption on the discounted side then increases the demand uh, on the far side, which then can increase profits. And obviously, if the yellow box exceeds um, you know, the blue box, it's forfeit on the left, you know, assuming Hessian conditions and whatnot, then obviously it's profit maximizing to do so. So it's quite interesting to see that. It also raises a fairly obvious question that was present at that time as they were talking about Microsoft's antitrust and possible breakup. One of the issues there is are consumers worse off under monopoly? Well, if you have two independent goods, the prices and the consumer surplus would be uh, as shown here. But if you internalize the externality, then you can discount to one side and give away to um, giving it away and then attract more to the other side. And for a large number of demand curves, that's a strict Pareto improvement. Uh, again, the firm by internalizing the externality then makes folks better off, which then leads to a number of the, the standard propositions that, that I think everyone on this call is aware of, such as perpetual free pricing to one side of the market. Or we then see, of course, media operating system, e-commerce market concentration, as you have one side attracting the other and attracting uh, the first side again with a nice positive feedback. Or business models that invade privacy on one side in order to sell matches uh, to the other side. Or we get these interesting seesaw effects where a sudden price hike on one side associated with a price drop on the other, or in the reverse, the 2010 Financial Reform Act capping interchange bank debit fees 
um, for banks then increased consumer fees on the other side of the market. Uh, or, and then empirically, these two-sided models are very valuable because they help to solve the reflection problem. If it's one monolithic homogenous market, it's really hard to say what you know when one group attracts a member of the same group. But if it's a cross group, then instruments might measure the shock to one side of the market, which then allow us to identify uh, you know, changes on the other side of the market. So it's quite valuable to introduce these other models to capture some of these network effects. To internalize these, the platform in effect serves as a regulator in any number of different forms. So the platform often serves as a competition authority or a price regulator, an intellectual property and licensing authority or an enforcer. I'm gonna come back to the licensing intellectual property in just a moment. But what's interesting is that as the platform starts to absorb state functions on adjudication and these other questions, if government's model succeeds when it adjudicates partner conflict, so you know, consumer to developer, because it wants to keep both sides on platform, the governance often fails when adjudicating partner to platform because it's king relative to subjects or when the externalities happen off platform. And I think all of those things are gonna be present and we'll come back to them in just a moment. So firm structure is an interesting question. Um, we had, for those of you in finance, there's some really bizarre properties of platforms relative to other firms. If you take a look at the year, these, these are, I've tried to find firms that are relatively similar in industry. So Uber and BMW or Marriott and Airbnb or uh, Walt Disney and Facebook. If you take a look at the year of the founding, the platforms are much later, much more rapid rise, but their market capitalizations are as large or larger with an order of magnitude fewer employees. As a matter of fact, if you look at the far right, the ratio of um, market cap per employee is you know, eight to 45 times um, relative, a standard style firm to a platform style firm. What's going on there? Well, one of the, most of the models are usually pricing models. We try to take a step further and actually do a production model. Uh, of some of these uh, firms. So uh, the first equation here is the profit, um, the profits of the platform. So the, the V is the intrinsic value and it's gonna give away an open code share. The next two terms are the royalties charged to production on developers. There's a price times output and a price times output across two periods. And the developers get to keep what they're not charged in royalties and it's discounted into the future. Output in this case is standard Cobb Dublix form, but it's a little different. So the first is the input is what's given away in the code. And then it's recursive in such a way that the code is reusable in the next period. It's an endogenous growth model in effect. Um, so that you, that what's produced in the first period can then be used as code in production of the second period. So the more developers there are, the more production can effectively happen with this non-rival good. This then allows us to model different structures. So we can try to model platforms. In this case, we model this question of the firm setting intellectual property policy and competition policy, how much code is public and when do developers face competition. The platform, developers own production, but the platform makes decisions. Or we can model vertical integration where the platform makes all decisions and owns all production. It doesn't have to give any subsidies away. Um, it can build on all the code, not just the public code, and it doesn't pay anybody any royalties, but there's no externality. Or you can model markets where the developers each independently decide and they own production, and they can decide to share their code, but if they do, then they can't make money on what they've given away or opened and shared. So there's a prisoner's dilemma. You'd like uh, the other developers to open their code, even as you like to keep yours closed. What we effectively managed to show then is that if network effects are large enough, platform structure of production dominates both vertical integration and pure markets. Once network effects become large enough, vertical integration dominates most um, parameter values, but once network effects become large enough, you can't scale network effects inside the firm, so you have to scale them outside the firm. Similarly, pure markets with developers, each one deciding independently faces this prisoner's dilemma. And so they don't give their code away soon enough. They wanna keep making money. So you need someone to actually force them into competition in order that each can build on the other's code at a particular time in the future. 
In effect, XNLs apply that platforms dominate both markets and hierarchies when the firm inverts. Well, this will matter when we get back to antitrust. The explanation for this phenomenon then is platform production is effectively off the books. Third parties are doing a lot of the production. So third parties are providing the ride on Uber or the rooms on Airbnb or the content on Facebook uh, in a way that is not on Walt Disney. So it's really interesting that third parties are in effect providing that value. Which brings us to the third set of issues, antitrust. The interesting challenges in markets and in predation and in solutions. So when you're defining market dominance, is market share high and is it abused? We have this question, is Amazon in books, cloud, publishing, e-commerce, home devices, or groceries? Is Alibaba in e-commerce, health insurance, payments, banking, movies, or logistics? Is Google in email, search maps, homes, or self-driving cars? What about our traditional tests? Are platforms restricting output? Usually you have output as a function of marginal cost as a test for that restriction. But here, Google doesn't restrict our searches, maps, or email. Alibaba and Amazon don't restrict uh, purchases or sales. And Facebook certainly doesn't restrict posts or reads. And then what about the SNP test, you know, small but significant increase in price? Price above marginal cost is a test of market power, or price below marginal cost, often a test of predation. But of course, profit maximizing price here is often zero, which causes that to be problematic. Well, again, return to these externality issues. In every single case, if we take a look at it, defining the boundaries is hard if it's third-party production rather than first-party production, if others are providing uh, a lot of the services. Um, or what about restricting output? You're far less motivated to restrict uh, output if third parties are providing the rides, the rooms, posts, and web pages. You incur zero marginal cost. So every incremental interaction is incremental revenue. You're not incurring marginal costs at all. Of course, in the uh, two-sided network effects, of course, in the pricing models, obviously the, the zero price is frequently uh, optimal. Which brings us then to several of the regulatory questions. What are the effects of GDPR? Well, quite interestingly, GDPR was effectively restoring things to a market. This is almost exactly like the decentralized market I showed you a moment ago, where each developer is effectively choosing what code to share. It's exactly like what information users would share willingly with others. We are effectively killing the spillovers. The empirical evidence from that was quite interesting. So after introducing GDPR, yes, privacy rose, but advertising effectiveness fell. A new app development fell. Venture capital investment uh, in European startups fell. And uh, most tellingly, um, the, one of the goals was trying to get more competition in the ad space, but the opposite happened. Smaller firms without access to data uh, and, and having a harder time negotiating for it, lost ground to Google and Facebook. So it effectively made Google and Facebook more entrenched. To provide a really simple intuition as to what's happening, too many of the interventions are using old rivalrous models when um, the platforms are effectively driven by network effects. So everyone in this group is quite familiar with Metcalf law, which is of course, value rises in proportion to n squared. So what happens if we break up Facebook across Instagram, uh, WhatsApp, and Facebook? You'd have three different firms. Well, uh, n over three squared gives you n over n squared over nine, and then you've got three firms back. You've got a third of the value that you had before. In effect, you're spreading the network effects over smaller pools which suggests a different style intervention. Suppose instead we allow that it's a non-rival resource and we allow others in. So suppose users had control and they could allow Amazon to recommend books based on your Facebook friends or Facebook could recommend friends based on your Amazon reading or Google could manage your ads on Facebook. Now we're allowing shared governments or, um, we're, and not splitting up the data. This way, each could access the other's users with permission. The user becomes the bottleneck, so they get the rewards, and then it's possible to combine data. This is likely to be a more effective intervention. In effect, decentralizing governance and allowing folks to compete uh, for it in order to create that value so we can actually boost 
the value rather than destroy the value by dividing it, which are the traditional interventions. This brings us to the, the fourth category for the day, which is in effect misinformation. Um, personally, I think this is one of the problems of our day. Uh, societies cannot function if we cannot agree on uh, who's president, uh, if we can't agree on whether vaccines work or not, uh, if we can't agree on whether the planet is warming or not. Interestingly enough, I view this as a problem of negative externalities as opposed to positive externalities. This is the externalities that are occurring off platform, which the platforms do not internalize. All too frequently, most folks think the misinformation is truth or falsity, and I would assert that's probably not the issue. To illustrate, uh, much false news just doesn't matter. Is Pluto an asteroid or a planet? Is an ad an exaggeration? What about irony, comedy, or parody? Fake news that's disbelieved just is not a problem. Contrast that with true information that is a problem. So Russia used true information to suppress black votes in the United States. Uh, the anti-vaxxers use um, half-truths or misleading two truths to create a lie. So a famous person did receive the uh, vaccine. A famous per that same person did die two weeks later, but it had absolutely nothing to do with the COVID vaccine. And let you, the implication can be that yep, the vaccine caused the problem. Or true news that is disbelieved can be a problem. More frankly, I think the real problem is to clear communications of information that causes decision error or negative externalities at scale. To give examples, the loss of herd immunity from the anti-vaccination campaigns or the shooting that takes place off platform in a pizza parlor or the insurrections that take place at the Capitol um, because the foment that has occurred on platform, the damage occurring off platform. To articulate the nature of the problem in this context, externalities cause market failures. Market failures require interventions. Government intervention is forbidden by the First Amendment of the United States and by convention in much of the Western countries. And platforms have the wrong incentives. Uh, you know, they, they are maximizing engagement and not dealing with the externalities that happen off platform. Um, you know, as Steve mentioned, I've been working on this issue for a while. And so I believe that there are solutions that do exist. I believe the solution is possible combining decentralized governance, effectively using marketplaces with coasts to deal with them. And we also need signals and screens uh, to this because it's, we need to signal uh, when someone does know something versus we need credible signals when someone does know something and when they don't, and we don't currently have those. Um, but the point uh, that I'm going to make here is this requires institutions that we do not currently have. And I think one of the big issues here is to design institutions uh, to make that happen. So to briefly recapitulate, cross-market externalities uh, explain a large number of really interesting phenomena over the past 20 years. So one is the two-sided pricing, it's the invasions of privacy, uh, it's market concentration. They explain why governance is necessary. Some institution or mechanism must internalize the externality. Um, otherwise we get, we get uh, transactions failure. Um, either good transactions don't occur or bad transactions do occur. Um, why platforms beat markets and hierarchies. When externalities are large enough, production moves from inside to outside and we get these inverted firms. That means that antitrust interventions designed to move us back toward market competition tend to divide assets and destroy value. So we need more sophisticated mechanisms. And I believe uh, we can do that, but we're going to actually use governance to do it rather than splitting the assets. Um, lastly, this also explains why antitrust and privacy interventions that promote competition, dividing those assets, destroy value. We really do need better ways to do it. The implication is new research should focus on things like decentralized governance to address the positive externality, that anti, which is the antitrust problem. So how do we deal with these super large companies? And I think um, decentralized governance will be the mechanism to do that. And similarly, I think we can design decentralized governance institutions to address the negative externalities of misinformation. Uh, so those are the those are so many of the issues. And again, uh, what's interesting to me is that of all of these issues are all driven by the same underlying phenomenon. So in some ways, we've been studying these things for uh, for twenty odd years, and um, they're just very different implications, different ways of viewing the same problem. So um, Regina asked me to stop in twenty minutes, and we're at nineteen minutes and forty seconds. So I will stop there and invite uh, questions and thoughts on on any of these. Um, uh, any of these ideas.